we're going to have when it comes to the metaverse is something like a distributed identity, um, especially how we deal with identity. And there's basically three different approaches to this, right? Centralized, decentralized, and then having multiple identities. Now, what makes this more interesting from that viewpoint is we've already dealt with a lot of these systems in our own real world, right? We've already dealt with centralized systems, but now we have to think globally, right? We have to think about things like a, basically your internet passport or whatever. But the creation of a global identity system is going to be an interesting process, right? And it's not just from the user side, it's the legal side, it's the technological side. Now, we already have systems that will scale. We have things like Google, Active Directory, Okta, Facebook. So we've already addressed a lot of these centralized systems in a lot of ways, and we're already comfortable with them. You log in everywhere, often, sometimes using your Google or your Microsoft or your Facebook account. Okta is a smaller company that's up and coming that deals with identity management. So it's really kind of neat that we already have some of the technological problems already addressed. What we really need to look at now are the social and political side, right? So the problem with development of a centralized system is that it has to be acceptable by every government and then used by every person. Now, why this is a really good idea, we can track fraud, we can track crime, we can do all these things, but then what do we do about people that don't have an official ID or don't have access to get an official ID? Now, what's interesting is per the World Bank, about 1 billion people don't have any form of government ID. So it's about an eighth of the global population. Now, blockchain can definitely solve this problem. It's an interesting problem to solve. It has some real serious solutions that can be done as a digital ID. And it would be decentralized because it would be in the blockchain. But the, then the question arises, who gets access and who uses it and how is it used? Because it's an immediate target for hackers. If it's in the chain and it's public and I can read everything about it, one, my coffee maker, it's an immediate target for hackers, right? It can also cause some real serious problems because we already have a surveillance state, right? We can use to track movement and we already do this, right? Your cell phone already does this. So it's kind of a moot point at this point, but it's something to think about because other countries' definition of privacy means something different. And in the term privacy in some countries has no direct meaning. It just doesn't simply exist as a problem. So tracking movement, tracking people, tracking finances, tracking all these other things turns into this really interesting idea, especially with the varying levels of what we term privacy across the world. And again, even in the United States, we have this problem in India, Saudi Arabia, and China all have different definitions and different meanings. And we've been kind of whittling away at what privacy really means as we got more and more into this technological age. The metaverse is just going to be an extension of that process. Then the next one is decentralized. We already have some of that today because if you take a look at how Google and Facebook and Microsoft are already structured, we already have multiple identities and we already have a decentralized system, right? Google has got stuff everywhere. Microsoft has got stuff everywhere. Facebook has got stuff. And in some cases, your Apple account can be tied to your bank, your school. And all these rely on a representation of identity with varying levels of verification. All right, so I can literally just hand out and go do a thing. What was interesting is when I set up my MetaMask account, because it's a financial system, I had to cough over a copy of my driver's license. And my, I, my electronic information that I put into that had to match exactly what was on my driver's license. So I have a full name, but I use a nickname in my everyday life. and I don't even think about it. I'm constantly using my nickname all the time because I really love my nickname. I think it's great. I enjoy it. I use it all the time. It is a preferred name. So when filling out that system, my bank had much more information that they needed than Google. I have multiple personalities on Google, which is kind of fun because I use them for different things. So again, decentralized actually works, but we have a real ID system now that can be gotten around with fake identities. Right? So I could have gotten around the banking information just by having a fake state issued looking driver's license, right? And the other one is that I can have a series of identities across a bunch of different nodes. And each one of those identities is going to have a separate profile. So my cell phone usage is relatively minimal because I understand how much I am tracked on my cell phone. My desktop usage is a lot more, even though I understand just how much information I'm giving away to my ISP and everybody else with the 200 and some odd tracking cookies that go along with that. Right. So 
understanding how all those systems work together and understanding how most real ID systems can be gotten around, especially with a fake identity, especially with Facebook. Facebook got into a point there for a while where they were literally questioning all of my friends' identities. And what's interesting, a lot of my friends are like actors or actresses and I'll have a stage name, which is smart. And Facebook was having a problem distinguishing that stage name against the real person name. And again, me with my nickname that I love and use. So we had to get around it. And a lot of people I know just simply cuffed over a fake Photoshop driver's license and said, here's my real ID. So each one of those identities now has a separate profile. You have a stage name, an actor's name, or you have a personality that's internet based, and then you have the real person. So decentralized does not solve that problem, right? It's resistance to attack but it doesn't really truly validate the person behind the keyboard. Again, getting a Google account, an Active Directory account, all that stuff's really super easy and really super quick. Now there's a lot of edge cases on this, right? Because we really do already have this system, but now we need to tie it in a real way to a real person and into a tangible electronic ID. And that's gonna trip everybody that believes in freedom and privacy and blah, blah, blah. But again, not everyone in the world has that same definition as the United States. Now, the other one we already have as well is multiple, right? So obviously we already have all these systems in place, right? So along with these centralized, we all have multiple personalities. Again, stage names, actors' names. Um, I'm a whistleblower. I have some edge case out there that I need to do. So it's like for me, TikTok cracks me up, right? Because if you take a look at TikTok and you match it against Twitter and you match it against Facebook, they're all tracking the exact same data off my cell phone. Each one of those data things is exactly the same. So while we're all wound up about TikTok, right, I don't really know that they care I watch cat videos, right? That identity is really super minimalistic, but because they're on my phone, they have a lot of other information. They have the contacts, search history, financial information, which is interesting, purchases, right? So make your purchases someplace else. That way they don't have traction into that. And it's not unique. Right, so this is just another, this is Twitter actually, right? They track the same thing that TikTok, that Facebook, that everybody else tracks. So it's not unique. My banking app, other social media, all follow the same formula about what they track. So my purchases, my contact info, any user content that I create, which is interesting, right? Any browsing history, browsing in what context, right? Any data usage and my location, whenever it's on, all my contacts, search history, identifiers and diagnostics. So it's really kind of cool that they track all this stuff. And then the data that they use inside the cell phone to grab you. So we already have this system, we're already comfortable with it, but we do have multiple personalities and it's really hard to harmonize those as we kind of go because now we have a problem distinguishing a bot, a botnet, or a sock puppet from a person becomes that next real challenge when you have multiple personalities. And as we get more into AI and we take a look at chat GPT and we take a look at a lot of these other systems out there, we don't have a globally uniform policy to deal with a bot or a sock puppet. We just don't. And then the other real interesting challenge gives in the state level interest in psyops, right? The amount of trash and misinformation and disinformation that's inside of our social networks right now is absolutely honking phenomenal, right? I mean, honestly, you can't trust any of it because a lot of it is just honking, not even close to being true, but it's state level. And then people that go along because, oh, hey, let's just cause some mayhem. Oh, I want to be a troll. Oh, I want to screw with someone's life. That multiple personality, that inability to tell a real ID from a non-real person becomes an issue. And then we can bring about into that whole process, what do you do with a social credit score? Right? So China has a very open and direct social credit score. America has one on the surface as well with your credit score. And your credit score is based on your zip code and a bunch of other information and your purchase and your repayment history and a bunch of other things that go into your credit report that really becomes a social responsibility index. So it's really kind of interesting. How do we tie all this stuff together? And now there's edge cases. Now, I love these edge cases because, one, we really, truly do need to have an anonymy process for a whistleblower um, reporting major crimes. We have a lot of stuff that we do that does require a certain level of anonymity, right? We can't just come out and say that Senator blah, blah, blah is taking bribes, all right? That's big, right? I don't want to be splashed across the front page of the Washington Post. No one does, 
right? So that need for anonymity, especially if I'm whistleblowing or I'm reporting a crime or something else and I don't have the ability to get involved. Then there's a need for security because we're tracking location and because we're tracking a lot of this other information. How do we deal with people that are victims of domestic violence or major crime or something else? So there is a need and graduated need for security around that real ID globally, right? There really is gonna need this, but the definition of domestic violence changes as you go country to country and background to background. Then you have legitimate and illegitimate government needs. Right. We have all the things that NSA watches and, we, and they're not unique. Right. Every government does this. But then there's legitimate government needs. Say I'm filling out for my SSI or I'm doing something with Social Security or I'm doing something with the Veterans Administration or I am interacting with government. Say I'm doing something on the state level. Right. How do we do those legitimate government needs against government needs to monitor and watch? Then there's access by law enforcement. How do we process that? What does that all look like? Right now, if you take a look at how law enforcement accesses information out of Google or information or, li or accesses information out of Facebook, it's really interesting blanket kind of information. How many people access this system in this geographic zip code? And they can tell you that, right? But right now, access to Leo is pretty much so a turnstile. It's an open door. And then what do we do about background investigations? Right, you can't get a job, you can't get an apartment, you can't do a lot of things without having a background investigation. How do we solve or manage data in a background investigation that could be wrong? So like I was doing some contract work for a company and I had a background investigation and that's fine. And there's a, another guy up in Shoreline that has my exact same name, uses the exact same nickname um, and gets confused. The systems always get confused about this. Well, apparently that other guy went to the hospital and he had some issue and that popped up that, oh, hey, he went to the hospital and he didn't pay his bill on that background investigation. I'm like, oh, that's not me. I don't live a hundred miles away. I live here. So that background investigation, we had to clear that up somehow, some way, and eventually we we're able to do it. But if it's in a blockchain and if it's immutable and something like that, a simple transcription error on a medical record can throw people off. So we have to have an ability to not just deal with the data, but be able to take out data that we don't want or don't need or don't apply to us. So on that distributed identity, right, there are three basic different approaches and we've all dealt with all three of them. There's a lot of edge cases and there's a lot of people that don't have government ID. So Given the geopolitical spectrum, how do we solve for a single globally acceptable ID? Going to be interesting. This is an interesting problem to solve. I mean, like a really, truly interesting problem to solve. Because not just on the edge cases, but data, data management, the fact that you're going to get hacked because you will become a centralized target. And they do. They've taken out systems like India's central identity system, gone. Someone just took a bunch of biometric information and put it up on eBay. So it's not a big surprise here, right? Now, the question is, how do we maturely handle this problem? And the metaverse is going to have to get this right because the system needs to function and function in a global way that makes sense for everybody. And that's it for this lecture. I will see you in the next one.